Manika, and I'm excited to be reading from Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye as we celebrate its 50th birthday. I'll read a section and then I'll share a few thoughts at the end. As you know, this is a read-along and so if you'd like to catch the full reading, you can catch that on Instagram at lovekindcure. Three whores lived in the apartment above the Breedlove storefront, China, Poland, and Miss Marie. Piccola loved them, visited them, and ran their errands. They, in turn, did not despise her. On an October morning, the morning of the stove lid triumph, Piccola climbed the stairs to their apartment. Even before the door was opened to her tapping, she could hear Poland singing, her voice sweet and hard, like new strawberries. I got blues in my meal barrel, blues up on the shelf. I got blues in my meal barrel, blues up on the shelf, blues in my bedroom, cause I'm sleeping by myself. Hi Dumplin, wear your socks. Marie seldom called Piccola the same thing twice, but invariably her epithets were found one or fond ones chosen from menus and dishes that were forever uttermost in her mind. Hello, Miss Marie. Hello, Miss China. Hello, Miss Poland. You heard me. Where are your socks? You as bedraggled as a yard dog. I couldn't find any. Couldn't find any. Must be something in your house that loves socks. China chuckled. Whenever something was missing, Marie attributed its disappearance to something in the house that loved it. There is something in this house that loves brassiers, she would say with alarm. Poland and China were getting ready for the evening. Poland forever ironing, forever singing. China sitting on a pale green kitchen chair, forever and forever curling her hair. Marie never got ready. The women were friendly, but slow to begin talk. Piccola always took the initiative with Marie, who, once inspired, was difficult to stop. How come you got so many boyfriends, Miss Marie? Boyfriends? Boyfriends? Chitlin? I ain't seen a boy since 19 and 27. You didn't see none there. China struck the hot curlers into a tin of new Nile hairdressing. The oil hissed at the touch of the hot metal. How come, Miss Marie? Piccola insisted. How come what? How come I ain't seen a boy since 19 and 27? Because they ain't been no boy since then. That's when they stopped. Folks started getting born old. You mean that's when you got old, China said. I ain't never got old, just fat. Same thing. You think cause you skinny folks think you young, you make a haint by a girdle. And you look like the north side of a southbound mule. All I know is them bandy little legs of yours is every bit as old as mine. Don't worry about my bandy legs. That's the first thing they push aside. All three of the women laughed. Marie threw back her head from deep inside. Her laughter came like the sound of many rivers, freely, deeply, muddily, heading for the room of an open sea. China giggled spastically. Each gasp seemed to be yanked out of her by an unseen hand, jerking an unseen string. Poland, who seldom spoke unless she was drunk, laughed without sound. When she was sober, she hummed mostly or chanted blues songs 
of which she knew many. Piccola fingered the fringe of a scarf that lay on the back of a sofa. I never seen nobody with as many boyfriends as you got, Miss Marie. How come they all love you? Marie opened a bottle of root beer. What else are they gonna do? They know I'm rich and good looking. They wants to put their toes in my curly hair and get at my money. You rich, Miss Marie? Puddin, I got money's mammy. Where you get it from? You don't do no work. Yeah, said China, where you get it from? Hoover gave it to me. I did him a favor once for the FBNI. What you do? I did him a favor. They wanted to catch this crook, you see, name of Johnny. He was as low down as they come. Oh, we know that, China arranged a curl. The FBNI wanted him bad. He killed more people than TB. And if you crossed him, whoa, Jesus, he'd run you as long as there was ground. Well, I was little and cute then. No more than 90 pounds soaking wet. You ain't never been soaking wet, China said. Well, you ain't never been dry. Shut up. Let me tell you, sweetening. To tell it true, I was the only one who could handle him. He'd go out and rob a bank or kill some people, and I'd say to him soft like, Johnny, you shouldn't do that. And he'd say he just had to bring me pretty things, lacy drawers and all that. And every Saturday, we'd get a case of beer and fry up some fish. We'd fry it in meal and egg batter, you know, and when it was all brown and crisp, not hard though, we'd break open that cold beer. Marie's eyes went soft as the memory of just such a meal sometime, somewhere transfixed her. All her stories were subject to breaking down at descriptions of food. Piccola saw Marie's teeth settling down into the back of crisp sea bass, saw the fat fingers putting back into her mouth tiny flakes of white hot meat that had escaped from her lips. She heard the pop of the beer bottle cap, smelled the acridness of the first stream of vapour, felt the cold beeriness hit the tongue. She ended the daydream long before Marie, but what about the money? She asked. China hooted. She's making like she's the lady in red that told on Dillinger. Dillinger wouldn't have come near you less than he was going hunting in Africa and shoot you for a hippo. Well, this hippo had a ball back in Chicago. Whoa, Jesus, 99. How come you always say, whoa, Jesus, and a number? Piccola had long wanted to know because my mama taught me never to cuss. Did she teach you not to drop your drawers? China asked. Didn't have none, said Marie. Never saw a pair of drawers till I was 15 when I left Jackson and was doing day work in Cincinnati. My white lady gave me some old ones of hers. I thought they was some kind of stocking cap. I put it on my head when I dusted and when she saw me, she liked to fell out. But <laughs> you must have been one dumb somebody, China lit a cigarette and cooled her irons. How'd I know? Marie paused. And what's the use of putting something you got to keep taking off all the time? Dewey never let me keep them on long enough to get used to them. Dewey who? This was somebody new to Piccola. Dewey who? Chicken, you never heard me tell of Dewey? Marie was shocked by her negligence. No, ma'am. Oh, honey, you missed half your life. Whoa, Jesus, 195. You're talking about smooth. I met him when I was 14. We ran away and lived together like married for three years. You know, all those clinker tops you see running up here, 50 of them in a bowl wouldn't make a dewy prince ankle bone. Oh, Lord, how that man loved me. China arranged a finger full of hair into a bang effect. Then why he left you to sell tail? Girl, when I found out I could sell it, that somebody could would pay cold cash for it, you could have knocked me over with a feather. 
Poland began to laugh soundlessly. Me too. My auntie whipped me good that first time when I told her I didn't get no money. I said, money? For what? He didn't owe me nothing. And she said, the hell he didn't. They all dissolved in laughter. Three merry gargoyles, three merry harridans. Amused by a long ago time of ignorance, they did not belong to those generations of prostitutes created in novels with great and generous hearts dedicated because of the horror of circumstance to ameliorating the luckless, barren life of men, taking money incidentally and humbly for their understanding. Nor were they from that sensitive breed of young girl, gone wrong at the hands of fate, forced to cultivate an outward brittleness in order to protect her springtime from further shock. But knowing full well she was cut out for better things and could make the right man happy. Neither were they the sloppy, inadequate whores who, unable to make a living at it alone, turned to drug consumption and traffic or pimps to help complete their scheme of self-destruction, avoiding suicide only to punish the memory of some absent father or to sustain the misery of some silent mother. Except for Marie's fabled love for Dewey Prince, these women hated men all men without shame, apology or discrimination. They abused their visitor with a, with a scorn grown mechanical from use. Black men, white men, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, Jews, Poles, whatever, all were inadequate and weak. All came under their jaundiced eyes and were the recipients of their disinterested wrath. They took delight in cheating them. On one, on one occasion, the town well knew they lured a Jew up the stairs, pounced on him, all three held him up by the heels, shook everything out of his pant pockets and threw him out of the window. Neither did they have respect for women who, although not their colleagues, so to speak, nevertheless deceived their husbands regularly or irregularly, it made no difference. Sugar-coated whores, they called them, and did not yearn to be in their shoes. Their only respect was for what they would have described as good Christian coloured women. The women whose reputation was spotless and who tended to her family, who didn't drink or smoke or run around. These women had their undying, if covert, affection. They would sleep with their husbands and take their money, but always with a vengeance. Nor were they protective and solicitous of youthful innocence. They looked back on their own youth as a period of ignorance and regretted they had not made more of it. They were not young girls in whores clothing or whores regretting their loss of innocence. They were whores in whores clothing, whores who had never been young and had no word for innocence. With Piccola, they were as free as they were with each other. Marie concocted stories for her because she was a child but the stories were breezy and rough. If Piccola had announced her intention to live the life they did, they would not have tried to dissuade her or voiced any alarm. You and Dewey Prince have any children, Miss Marie? Yeah, yeah, we had some, Marie fidgeted. She pulled a bobby pin from, bobby pin from her hair and began to pick her teeth. That meant she didn't want to talk anymore. Piccola went to the window and looked down at the empty street. A tuft of grass had forced its way through a crack in the sidewalk, only to meet a raw October wind. She thought of Dewey Prince and how he loved Miss Marie. What did love feel like, she wondered. How do grown-ups act when they love each other? Eat fish together? Into her eyes came the picture of Cholly and Mrs. Breedlove in bed, he making sounds as though he were in pain, as though something had led him by the throat and wouldn't let go. Terrible as his noises were, they were not nearly as bad as the no noise at all from her mother. It was as though she was not even there. Maybe that was love, choking sounds and silence. Turning her eyes from the window, Piccola looked at the women. China had changed her mind about the bangs and she was arranging a small but sturdy pompadour. 
She was adept in creating any number of hairstyles, but each one left her with a pinched and harassed look. Then she applied makeup heavily. Now she gave herself surprised eyebrows and a cupid bow mouth. Later she would make oriental eyebrows and an evilly slashed mouth. Poland, in her sweet strawberry voice, began another song. I know a boy who is sky soft brown. I know a boy who is sky soft brown. The dirt leaps for joy when his feet touch the ground. His strut is a peacock. His eyes is burning brass. His smile is sorghum syrup dripping slow sweet to the last. I know a boy who is sky soft brown. Marie sat shelling peanuts and popping them into her mouth. Piccola looked and looked at the women. Were they real? Marie belched softly, purringly, lovingly. So isn't she amazing as a writer? Um, so I, like the book, am in my 50s. And if I were to offer any advice to my younger self, I think it would be to be gentler and kinder to myself and to make sure that I surrounded myself by friends who supported me, encouraged me and helped me grow. And I also want to share that uh, when I was younger, around the age of 17, 18, I failed English literature. I was in school in London, England at the time. I took A-levels and I failed English literature. And I also practically failed all my other exams. And at the time I felt that that was the end of the world. I wasn't able to go to university, wasn't able to go to college. And I thought I never would be able to do that, but I did. I did go to college. I ultimately got an MA, a PhD. I have taught at universities. I've written a book that became a bestseller. And I'm saying all of this because my 18 year old self felt that the world was just falling apart for me when I failed that exam or, or those exams. And I'd like to tell my young self, you know, that not, not to be too flawed by what seem like failures or um, things that are not successes, that things really can turn around and get better. So I'd like to encourage all of you out there who think maybe that something terrible has happened and you're never gonna be able to do X, Y, and Z to know, look, if I can become a writer, if I can go to college, if I can teach and get a PhD, then you can too. And I just want to end uh, on Toni Morrison. I just had the amazing experience in 2017 of meeting Toni Morrison, going to her house in upstate New York and spending almost two hours with her, interviewing her in her home. And I took this book with me and I asked her to sign it for my son, which she did. And I remember saying to her, Tony, my son wants to know how you write so incredibly. And she said, tell him I'm a genius. And she was a genius. And, um, she is a treasure that we have. She has inspired me, and I trust that she will inspire you.